What's up, everyone? I'm Nathan Lustig, and welcome to Crossing Borders, where I interview entrepreneurs doing startups across borders and the people who support them, in this case, investors, with a focus on companies and people that have some relationship to Latin America. My guest today is Andres Barreto, a Colombian entrepreneur turned investor who specializes in helping companies with tech teams in Latin America succeed in the U.S., now partner at First Rock Capital, a VC firm that he co-founded after exiting Groove Shark, a music streaming service he founded while at university in the States, and Onswipe, a publishing company that was later acquired. Andres' business model with First Rock may sound a bit familiar because it's similar to what we do at Magma, with a few important twists that Andres and I will get into on the podcast. Andres and I get into his story, how he started a VC firm, why he thinks Latin Americans should go to the U.S. market as quickly as possible, pitfalls to avoid when getting funding from LATAM VCs, and some of the ways Latin American funds and governments can help make Latin American venture capital work better and be more competitive. We also talk about why U.S. companies should be looking at Latin America to build their tech teams and how U.S.-based investor attitudes toward Latin America have changed over the last five years or so. Andres and his partners have blazed the trail in leading Latin American entrepreneurs to scale in the U.S., and they recently closed a new fund, which can invest in companies with valuations up to $30 million. They've been doing a great job blazing a trail, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andres Barreto. Hello, Andres. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Nathan. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for taking the time to do it. So where are you in the world today? Today, I'm in Medellin, Colombia. Very nice. And you're from Colombia originally, right? I am, but I'm from Bogota, the capital city. Ah, oh, nice. So you're sort of cheating on Bogota being in Medellin. Since I left when I was 12, <laughs> I've always preferred warmer weather. Yeah. And Medellin is kind of perfect for that. Yeah, no, I agree. Medellin is really nice. And so what are you working on? So today, I'm really focused on helping our portfolio companies recruit top engineers in Medellin and scaling out all of their existing engineering teams to build better products faster. Nice. So you guys have just finished raising your second fund. And can you tell me a little bit about what kind of companies you look for and why you're in Colombia? Yeah. So the companies that we look for are companies that have as their primary and largest market, the U.S. market in any vertical, as long as they're using software or creating software rather to compete. So if it's a tech enabled company, we do not invest. But if it's a company that creates technology as their competitive advantage, we do invest. And what we look for is really five main points. The first one is that the entrepreneurs, the founders are able to write software. At least one of the founders is able to write software. Second, that the problem that they're solving is a problem that they've lived themselves as the customers. So ideally, they should be their first customer. Then third, there needs to be a product. Nowadays, technology is cheap enough that you can have an MVP prototype something running rather quickly without a lot of time or without a lot of funding. And that is followed by fourth, that there is already market adoption and so that there is some sustained evidence of growth and it's going to remain growing. Ideally, we'd look for the exponential growth, the famed hockey stick growth, um, so that it shows us that the market wants this. And then what makes this really unique and quite different from most VC funds in the US is, or in Latin America, is that we want the team to be open to having their engineering team in Latin America if they don't already have one. If they have one and the market is the US, then we're very likely to invest. If they don't have one and they want to experiment with it, we will invest and help them recruit those engineers. And we've been able to leverage some grants by different governments to be able to make that a more interesting proposition as the city of Medellin and the reason why I'm here will pay for the first couple of months of an engineer's salary plus all the incorporation costs and all the paperwork that needs to be taken care of to make that happen. So I think that's a really interesting tweak on the model of finding Latin American companies and helping them get to the States, actually going the other way back from the States to help them build a tech team in Latin America. Can you talk a little bit more about why that's advantageous to a startup in the States? Yeah, so we've noticed that as time goes on, there seems to be more funds, more capital. Technology gets cheaper and cheaper, making it so there's more startups. There's more of everything, and it seems like everything is growing exponentially except engineering talent. And so the commonality, independent of industry, independent investment thesis of the resource that is the most scarce resource is not money, is not technology, is the engineering talent to make that technology, to then make that money. And that's why there's a saying that, at least in Silicon Valley, that it's always easier to find an angel investor than an engineer. And it's very true. So what we've done is leverage 
that fact that talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. And as immigration policy in the U.S. gets more stringent on both illegal and legal immigration, the war for talent becomes even more difficult for U.S. companies. And so our proposition is the same money that you would spend hiring a junior engineer in New York or in the Valley between $90,000 to $120,000 a year, that engineer in Latin America would probably be $24,000 a year. But we're not saying go find somebody for $24,000 a year. What we're saying is still spend that $100,000 a year, but instead of getting somebody with four years of experience, get somebody with 15 years of experience or 10 years of experience so that having an engineering office not in the same place where you live or where you're working at at this given moment is not a challenge because it's people that usually tend to have as much experience as a technical co-founder of the startup or more often than not, more experience than the technical co-founder. So it's somebody at your level that you don't need to be micromanaging. And you're able then to hire people that are more senior. It takes less time to find them and recruit them. And they will stay in the company longer. Whereas in the Valley in New York, it's common to have 100% rotation every 18 months. And very difficult to attract people with 10, 15 years of experience for anything less than $300,000 a year. I like your phrase there, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. I think that's one of the things that people in the US really still haven't understood fully that they may start to think that there is talent other places, but I don't think they understand the sort of lack of opportunity or even if you build something amazing outside of the US, how much more difficult it is than building and scaling a company in the US. Yeah. I mean, in fact, after being in Latin America for so long, I now think that building a startup in the U.S. is ridiculously easy. And that is because I originally thought, and as many entrepreneurs have thought, and U.S. entrepreneurs, Latin American entrepreneurs, that if there's no Yelp in X country, if there's no Uber in X country, that that's the opportunity. But the reality is, is that there might not be a Yelp yet or an Uber yet, although eventually they'll get there. But in the beginning, it's not because of lack of technology or a lack of talent or lack of knowledge that there's models like that in the US. It's because of a lack of infrastructure, corruption, monopolies, oligopolies, and things that go beyond just technology that don't allow there to be companies like that, or just don't make it profitable for a company like Uber to launch Mexico before launching Europe. Now they're all over the world, but they went to Europe first, then they did Latin America. Or usually companies do US, Europe, Asia, and then Latin America. And that's because there are problems that go beyond just building a cool product. And the opportunity here is the fact that the internet makes it so that you don't have to go through customs or any wall or any free trade agreement in order to export digital goods. And you're able to both have the most profitable market in the world, which for now still remains the US, (laughs) with the most valuable resource that the rest of the world really has, or at least Latin America has, which is engineering talent and human capital, not just oil and copper. I think the Yelp example is a really good one. We use that with startups that have pitched us talking about we want to be the X for Latin America. And we run through the Yelp example of in the US, a small business is generally pretty profitable. So a restaurant could make money, hardware store can make money. So paying Yelp 500 or $1,000 a month to do paid advertising and be featured, it's really not that big of a deal. But when you look at Latin America and you look at, I mean, Chile, we use as the example, there's still only about 20% of households that make more than about 1500 or $1,800 per month. So a lot of that is from small businesses. And so If your take-home pay is only $1,800 a month, how much can you actually spend to support your business and advertise? And so thinking about that way, it makes it almost impossible to build a Yelp unless you are Yelp that has millions and millions of dollars of venture capital behind it. And Yelp did that for parts of Latin America and then backed out. And it's not profitable. And so I have a similar test that I run with startups. And it's kind of like a three criteria test. And that is, you should launch your startup or the product or validate your product in the place that has the following three criteria. Number one, the largest possible number of potential customers, followed by where they have the most money or wealthier customers. And finally, where you get that money the fastest. So when you compare regions or countries, you might say, okay, between Chile and Colombia, where can you find more customers? Colombia. That have more money? Chile, probably. That will give it to you faster. Chile, then Colombia for sure. 
But then when you compare Colombia with Mexico, Mexico wins on all of those. So they have more customers with more money that will give it to you the fastest. But when you compare Mexico to the U.S., then U.S. wins in all three categories almost all of the time. You could say the same thing for China, where there's more customers and there's not on an average ratio, but there's more millionaires in China than almost anywhere in Latin America. But good luck getting the money out. So that's where the component of speed to get the money comes in. And so if an entrepreneur decides to launch in the place with the least amount of customers that have less money that take longer to give it to you, it's not impossible. It's just you're making your life harder by going to a place where it's going to take more time and more money to get low return. You can still be very successful. And certainly there's success stories, but those stories happen every five years. And the level of success when you compare it to a U.S. company is significantly lower. Yet the effort and the time and the money it took is usually the same or more in Latin America than in the U.S. So in terms of a portfolio strategy for a VC, to us, we decided that did not make sense. We cannot rely on a company like Mercado Libre or Despegar or Rappi now is doing very well to happen every five years. For our portfolio strategy, for sure, the entrepreneurs are going to be very successful, but it just doesn't work for us as a VC fund. What do you say to entrepreneurs that are from Latin America that maybe are intimidated by the U.S. market? They think that everything's done in the U.S., I have to do it here, or maybe I don't know the language well enough. What do you tell them when you try to get them to think about the U.S. more than Latin America? So usually there is a reasoning or a logical process that makes sense in their mind. But then in terms of emotional commitment to that idea, it's harder. So what I try to communicate is just do, doing comparison. It is easier to get, and this was my experience. I met with El Mercurio in Chile, El Espectador in Colombia, El Universal in Mexico to use, for them to use my technology for my last startup, OnSwipe, which was a publishing platform and an advertising network for tablets and iPads and touch devices. And with the New York Times, I think it was a 45-minute meeting where they decided that they were going to do a pilot with us and we're going to go live with that pilot in two weeks. That's one of the largest newspapers in the world and for sure larger than any newspaper in Latin America. Yet those meetings with those newspapers in Latin America would be many meetings, then they have to go through a committee, then they have to get an approval, and then I'll get a budget maybe two years later for $5,000. And in the US, you have companies who have executives and their entire job as an executive is to meet startups and to spend money with startups because they have experimental budgets. They're supposed to do that. Whereas in Latin America, every decision, every business decision has to be done by committee. And committees, they're there I'm not sure why they're there. What's the historical background of committees? But usually they're there to deflect responsibility. So it's not that the head of digital decided to go with this platform. It's that the committee decided to go with that platform. And if it was a mistake, then we all made the mistake. It wasn't me. It was all of us that made that mistake. And so nobody's punished. By the same token, nobody's rewarded by taking the risky bet and being early with Snapchat or being early with Facebook or whatever. And they're not rewarded for taking the risky bets, but they will be punished for taking the wrong bet. And that's why they have the committees. And so it just takes longer. And in terms of the language, to me, it's easier to learn English, to travel to the US and even apply for a visa or whatever it takes to do that, than to make it so that there are more credit cards and more banked people in Mexico and in Colombia. It's just way easier. Yeah, I think the committee piece in Latin America is one of the least understood parts of why the businesses aren't taking tech more often. I think you know, if you look at a sales strategy in the US, if you have a new product, you sort of you need to sell why they're going to make more money or why it's going to make their life easier, sell the benefits. But in Latin America, when Part of our portfolio strategy is to do B2B deals in Latin America, but the sales process is you have to get to the person and convince them that if they do take a risk, they're not going to get fired. So it's a completely different psychology and a completely different sales process because in the US, if somebody does pass on Snapchat being early and they go to the competitor, the guy that passed on Snapchat might actually get fired for not right. doing it. Whereas in Latin America, the only way you're going to get fired is if you actually do take Snapchat and it doesn't work. Right. So let's go back to your story. So you mentioned on Swipe and you've got a lot of experience in the U.S. How did you first get to the U.S. from Colombia? I moved to the U.S. when I was 12 years old. I first moved to Miami. I usually I joke that I moved to Miami, then I moved to the U.S. And then I went to college at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Did my last semester, a study abroad in Chile. And that's when I was doing Pulso Social. So during college, I did Groove Shark, which was a music streaming service that reached 35 million unique listeners a month. And then after nine years of litigation, finally came to an out-of-court settlement where the labels shut it down. But in that meantime, 
I also created Pulso Social, which back in the day when I thought, oh, wow, there's no X for Latin America. I thought, hey, there's no tech crunch for Latin America. That should be super profitable and created Pulso Social. It does great, but it's not super profitable. And that we just covered tech news in Latin America in Spanish. So it's not just, you know, what Apple did or Microsoft did is what entrepreneurs in each country are doing, what VC funds in each country are doing. And it serves as inspiration and as a guide to other entrepreneurs. Then I built... At the same time that I was in Chile, I was trying to get companies to send me press releases. And I noticed that PR firms at that time either didn't exist or were terrible at pitching me. So I created a PR firm to make use of my writers. And around 2010, when I moved from Chile back to Miami, I wanted to further find a way to how to monetize Pulso Social, which was a publisher online blog, very difficult to monetize. And that's when I created OnSwipe, which became, I think after Facebook and Google on touch and web touch traffic, the largest property in the US. I'm not sure about Asia, but for sure in the US. And the interesting thing about that company is we raised, I think, $17 million got acquired in 2015. And And it was great. But the most interesting thing about that company is that I got it off the ground with an engineering team or talent in Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina. My engineers, at one point I had three engineers in Mexico, a designer in Colombia, and a designer in Argentina. And that's what allowed us to get it off the ground in the very beginning with one of the engineers in Mexico, get it off the ground with an investment of $700. That's all I had at that moment to launch a company. And that allowed us a month later or so to raise a million dollars. And then three months after that, raise $5 million. And it was by leveraging the talent in Latin America. At some point, we built an engineering team in New York. Then that's where I started noticing that it would take me six months to hire a VP of engineering, a VP of engineering with only two years of experience coding at that time. It was brilliant, but had only been coding for two years. And, you know, chemist that had been into, turned into a chef, then into programmer. But still, two years of experience. My CTO was a college dropout that we actually encouraged him to drop out. He was 19. He already sold two startups. We encouraged him to drop out to join us. And overall, we had brilliant young engineering talent. But when it came to scaling up, it was very difficult. Our second CTO took us a year and a half to recruit. And so when I compare that to the engineering talent that's available in Latin America for the same cost, it's triple the experience and way better in terms of getting a product done faster in the beginning for an early stage startup. If I were to hire that level of talent in the US, I would have to wait until my B round. And that's where you have a lot of people say, you know, oh, this person doesn't scale, quote unquote, they don't scale. Well, it's just you hire junior people from the beginning. So of course, they're not going to scale. And so we avoided that. And as an entrepreneur, having raised money from top VCs, top accelerators, there was always this feeling that my VCs really wanted to help. They were very smart, very, very intelligent, but they were limited in terms of time and resources to provide help just in the money, which is great, some connections, and then strategy. But when I needed kind of roll up your sleeves and get some work done, it was way harder for them to be able to provide that because how VC funds are structured traditionally, except for one one or two. And so that's why in 2013, I decided to be the investor I wish I would have had. And that was by doing more than just providing capital connections and strategy or opinions by doing real work. And because I had a PR firm at the time, because I had done every role in all of the companies from finance to product to engineering, I wanted to provide these services of doing real work, coding if I have to, designing if I have to, recruiting for a startup. And so I had a portfolio about four companies and I quickly realized why nobody does this. It's very time consuming just for companies. So instead of giving up, I found a way to create a team. Today, we are about 20 people. Six of us are 100% focused on just on the venture capital side. And we help with recruiting, BD, engineering, finance, and sales, well, business development sales with real work. And so that's by living the experience of having built companies in the US, having built companies in Latin America, using both engineers in the US, using engineers in Latin America, and being an entrepreneur is how we came to our investment theses that the best way to leverage or the best arbitrage is US market, Latin American talent, plus a team that can help our companies execute that thesis. And what has been the reaction in the U.S. to this model of having teams in Latin America, but then also an office in the States with the U.S. being the primary market? So in the beginning, I used to get a lot of pushback. It was actually kind of sad and comical at the same time that I would talk about my investment thesis two or three years ago. And I remember one reaction from very well-educated fund and fund of funds in San Francisco their first reaction was, wait, 
there's engineers in Colombia. I'm like, yeah, dude, <laughs> we also don't live in the jungle. We have internet and like electricity. It's wild. But yeah, the first reaction is, wait, there's engineers? And it was at the time kind of a fair point and it was acceptable, I feel, to an extent to be ignorant on the topic. Because if they were to ask, all right, what's the Skype of Latin America or what's the ways of Latin America? You know, Skype from Estonia, ways from Israel. There were none. And if I talk about the success stories, Mercado Libre and Despegar, that they're great for billion dollar companies, but they're only in Latin America. And it took them 15 years to do what apparently now it takes a startup two years to do, at least in their portfolios in Silicon Valley, with way less employees. They don't need thousands of employees. With 30 employees, you have a $19 billion company. So it was hard to show the stories or the successes of global companies and global engineering teams in Latin America competing in Silicon Valley or the rest of the world. Now it's a little bit easier because now we have Blue Smart, which is the first carry-on bag that's all in Argentina. Authy that got acquired by Twilio and Twilio kept the office in Colombia. That's very positive. Weissline by the founder of Uyala, who then created Weissline, also in Mexico. So now there's more stories to show, hey, do you know that this company is all built in, in Latin America? And people are like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I heard about the company, but I didn't know that all of their engineering team was in Argentina. So that's helping now. But then the other pushback I used to get was the VCs would say, oh, and some founders, but mostly VCs, would say, oh, we don't like remote team. And so when I would delve deeper about their portfolio, it turned out that most of their portfolio, their clients were in New York, but their headquarters were in San Francisco. So most of the time, the CEOs or the CRO or the CFO were traveling back and forth, or they had an office in New York for doing all of their sales and business development. And their engineering was in California. At that point, I pointed out to them, you do have a remote team. It just so happens that they're not brown. But it's like six hours between New York and California, more than San Francisco and Guadalajara or New York and Medellin. So you do have a remote team. And then the thesis of we only like investing in companies that are bicycle right away at that point was kind of the MO of VCs. But now they're starting to change their tune. There's actually a post by Fred Wilson from Unisquare Ventures called Mercenaries, where somewhere in the post, he says, if you have the ability to have an engineering team outside of the Bay Area, New York, Boston, it's your responsibility, kind of like your fiduciary duty to make sure that you have it outside there because of the whole rotation of talent and the mercenary nature of a lot of engineering talent. But even the VCs that didn't follow that more flexible philosophy, they really encourage you to be in Silicon Valley, even if your customers are in New York, even if you have to travel back and forth. And they say, and I've heard this a lot, if you want to be an actor, you go to LA. If you want to be an entrepreneur and have the best engineers, you come to Silicon Valley. And so if you follow that advice, sure, go to Silicon Valley, you're spending a ton of money traveling back and forth to see your customers. And then it's like, all right, we invest in you. You should hire the top people, A players, because you're only supposed to hire A players. Well, that becomes very difficult. And so you end up paying a lot of money for sometimes even B, C players, people that just graduated off a boot camp, paying them $84,000, $90,000 a year. It's questionable whether they're A players, but hey, you have to hire them. Or you're able to hire the A players for 180, 200K a year. And then in your sixth board meeting is when the VC says, how come your burn is so high? Well, damn, like (laughs) you told me to hire the people. And because it takes a long time to hire very good people, then now you're reliant. And I've heard investors say this. All right, then you should import people into the valley. So bring them from Minnesota. We had a bunch of people that we brought from Minnesota to New York. And we had people from the UK and people from Colombia and people from Mexico, people from Hong Kong that were trying to get H-1B visas. So you end up having to move the talent to Silicon Valley. And you have to overpay, not because they're not worth it. They're definitely worth it. It's just rent is really high and taxes are really high. So, you know, $120,000 a year, you can barely scrape by in San Francisco and New York. But yet that seems elitist. But you're still living in a shitty apartment where your entire kitchen, bedroom, bathroom is the size of like my closet in Medellin, for example. So they have like these preset ideas of having people on the same roof, having top level engineers, but also your burn should be low. So it doesn't make sense whatsoever. Now, it seems like they're more flexible about it. And at least the entrepreneurs, before I had to do a a lot of effort, put a lot of effort into convincing an entrepreneur that it's not outsourcing because they're full-time employees, they work for your company. They're not low quality because they think if they're not in the US, then it's freelancer.com type quality. And it's like, no, it's better than most of the time, better than your technical co-founder. And they're better than anything you can hire at the moment. And it used to be difficult before. But now it seems entrepreneurs are more open to it. And now it's not as hard to convince them. And we get a lot more inbound. So even if we're not inv- we cannot invest in that company, 
or it doesn't follow investment thesis or the company is too large already. Now we get a lot of inbound where entrepreneurs tell us, hey, even if you cannot invest, could you help me build an engineering team in Latin America? And at that point, I just give them tips, kind of like our guidebook, but I have to give priority and my time to the companies we have invested in. So it's changing. That's a positive. But we started from very, very far in terms of getting people to accept that you can have better engineers outside of the valley than in the valley. We're still seeing a lot of investors in the States with similar sort of ignorant attitudes. That surprised me because I sort of thought that it was more thought through of, okay, we've looked at Latin America. We don't like it for whatever reason. We don't believe in it. But what I've seen from the meetings we've had with VCs in the US taking our companies from Chile or from Argentina to the US, it's they haven't really thought it through and have, like you said, sort of the ignorant notion of, oh, is there internet or you know, they have the sort of Mexican drug wars and narcos and corruption yep. stories from Venezuela in their head. But that's about it. There hasn't been a full vetting of the thesis. And so we actually show like a 15 second video, a drone footage from Santiago to show like, hey, there's an actual city here. There's buildings. There's 7 million people here. And we actually get the most common comment is, wow, I didn't expect buildings. That day. <laughs> yeah, that's I've actually had a few entrepreneurs when I bring them to Medellin. I ask them at the end of their trip. Did it meet expectations, exceed expectations? Was it lower than what you expected? And I had one entrepreneur say, I actually didn't expect that there were going to be so many tall buildings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's that. And then we also had a pretty high level investor in the Valley that asked one of our US founders who has a team in Latin America, well, what happens if I invest and you just go to Latin America and, and don't come back and just take the money? And it was like, this is a U.S. entrepreneur incorporated in the U.S. It's like the same as if he would move to New York or move to Miami from Silicon Valley. And that was a real question in a real meeting. I mean, I couldn't believe that that would be still a question, but it was. I don't know how they kept a straight face. <laughs> yeah. I'm very, I'm very um, obvious or evident with my facial expressions. So when I get those questions, I kind of just try to look away, like look at my phone so that they can't tell I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> but what we've done in terms of or entrepreneurs do they have offices, I mean, they're in WeWork New York or in a WeWork in San Francisco. And the engineering team not being there with them is a footnote. Like it's not part of the conversation necessarily. And what kind of bothers me quite a bit is when an Israeli entrepreneur with an Israeli team talks about, you know, they're building self-driving cars or an ad network. Nobody questions them about having a team in Israel. But if it's Mexico, which is right next door, it's like, oh, well, we don't, we're not so comfortable about that. It's like, what? Why? <laughs> so that's kind of ridiculous. But I think it's changing now. No, it definitely is changing. There's been a few investors that are really interested in, I think, Latin America now because it sort of is the last frontier where, you know, investors do understand the Israel story. They do understand teams from Eastern Europe. They understand India. They understand Asia with either your market there or a team there. But Latin America is just sort of starting to come up. And like you said, we're getting inbound requests from Silicon Valley companies now too, saying, hey, can you help me put a tech team here? And so I think it's only positive for Latin America as more and more of these companies, like you mentioned Authy and you mentioned Blue Smart, and Diego was on the ninth episode of the podcast telling his story, having success. And I think as these companies keep growing, Something also that, that happens is they don't necessarily make it very public <laughs> that their team is in anime. I don't blame them. But I think there's going to be a point where it will be the feature story that their team is in Latin America. Something that works against us, however, or it works against us in terms of sharing the message, kind of the gospel of engineering talent in Latin America, is that there are VC funds and there are private equity funds and hedge funds that are interested in emerging markets. So whenever we talk about our theses, I also get the response of like, oh, yeah, we're not we don't bet in emerging markets. It's like, no, you, you're not listening to me. We're not investing in the Latin American market. We're investing in the U.S. market and leveraging Latin American talent. And so that is hard to process because there's a preset notion in the financial world that there's emerging markets and that's Brazil and Mexico and the BRICS. And it's like, I know that's what you're thinking, but we don't do that. And I actually get a lot of inbound of, hey, we're thinking about investing in Mexico or investing in Colombia, or my company wants to expand in Colombia and in Mexico. Is that something that your VC fund will invest or can you help us with that? And I say, sure. I mean, I can introduce you to my PR firm. They'll help you launch, but that's not what we do. We don't focus on the markets. If you were to ask me anything about the local market financially, I wouldn't know. Ask me all you want about the JavaScript engineering meetup, the Go meetup, the Ruby on Rails meetup, like how many engineers are working for a company. And I'll tell you the answer. But in terms of market, that's not what we do. And so it's hard for the financial world 
in the US and in Europe to separate the emerging markets from talent. It's like they see us as a market. They don't see us as a pool of talent. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I mean, there's just structurally thinking of emerging markets as one monolithic thing rather than there can be many different business models coming out of there. I mean, we had one of our companies was pitching a US investor and the investor said, well, why don't you just keep going in Latin America? They just because if they wanted to be diversified, they would invest in a company in the States and then also in Latin America. And it's like, no, this company is incorporated in the US. It just so happens their founders are Latin American and have a team in Latin America. So it yeah. is interesting, the sort of structural problem where it is emerging markets versus US and you can't sort of have something that's both. I mean, I think the only solution to that is just more effort on our part. And you've been doing a great job in writing content and getting people to start seeing this story. This is a new type of story. And I think as more press covers it or as more content out there about these stories of the blue smarts of the world, the authors of the world, it will be easier to have this conversation in maybe a couple of years' time. Yeah, I think so. I think that's sort of been our number one thing since we started back in 2013 is we need to share the model, put content out there, talk about stories that are happening. But then you also have to have the beef behind it. You have to have the companies like Authy and Blue Smart that do well and actually show, hey, you know, you missed out on this deal because you're either ignorant of Latin America or rejected it because it didn't fit your thesis. I'm actually starting to see more Latin American VCs miss out on these type of deals. Originally, they were just missing out on the deals that were US market, Latin American team, even if the founder was Latin American. But now I'm also seeing them lose out to deals where it's Latin American market. And that's a very interesting phenomena where there's, there seems to be more capital for the best entrepreneurs in the region, whether or not the market's the US or Latin America. So let's jump into that a little bit more. Why do you think that's happening? Why do you think the LATAM VCs are missing either the US market LATAM founder model or the top LATAM founders working in Latin America? So it's actually, I feel like it's three very technical reasons that have a larger business impact. And I remember many years, 2012, I was giving a talk in Startup Chile, where part of my recommendation was don't let Latin American VCs lead your rounds. And I remember Anaheim from the next web was in the audience. And I realized, hmm, maybe, Anna, could you please not publish that? And of course, <laughs> being a very good journalist, she did what she was supposed to do. And she made that the headline. And that's Barreto, don't let Latin American VCs lead your round, which made me reflect of like, all right, instead of criticizing, because I hate criticizing without providing solutions. And so Instead of just criticizing, I, that's part of my thinking of, you know what, maybe I should become the investor that I wish I would have had, the investor that I think people in Latin America should have. I'm not just kind of complaining, because complaining is easy, solving is harder. But I like doing things hard and like taking the harder road and <laughs> everything I've done, apparently. That said, I now understand why most VCs follow this model in Latin America. And at the end of the day, you have to do whatever you can to make money, however you think it is that you can make money. So... If VCs think that this is the structure that they can make more money, then great, follow that structure. But I do see the repercussions of that structure. And the structure really is based on the fact that Latin American venture capital is very new. And I think, I believe in Colombia, it's only like six years old or seven years old. Most of Latin America is really, really new. What existed before venture capital was private equity. And the multilateral banks, development banks, Inter-American Development Bank with FOMIN, Corfo in Chile, INADEM in Mexico, Bancoldex in Colombia. It seems that they all adopted, inherited the private equity rules to venture capital. And private equity and venture capital in the U.S. were created parallel, not kind of the same function. But in Latin America, it was first PE, then VC. And so there are certain rules in private equity that shouldn't apply to venture capital. But in Latin America, they make them the rules to receive money from the multilateral funds. And I would say most of the funds in Latin America have money from multilateral funds, or the majority of their money comes from multilateral funds or development banks. And so they have to adhere to these rules. And the rules that I think hurt them in terms of deal flow or closing on a very good deal very quickly are number one killer is the investment committee going back to committees, is not just the general partner of the fund. So in the US, the partners of the fund, they're the investment committee. In Latin America, you can be the fund manager, but you're not the one making the decision. Or you're not the only one making the decision. You have an external investment committee. And so the problem with that is that you have deals that if a US VC is looking at that deal, they can meet with the founder on Monday, and then Monday morning, and then Monday afternoon, the founder has a term sheet 
due diligence will happen within two or three weeks if it's a seed round. And then there's a million dollars in the bank within four weeks. And that's how I've raised money in the US myself. Whereas if that same deal is also being looked at by a Latin American VC, they first have to do the first meeting, then take it to the investment committee. The investment committee is made up of members that are not working in the fund all day, every day, meeting every founder and talking to every single deal that's going on in the ecosystem. They're usually somebody from the development bank, somebody from a large corporation, a renowned consultant, author, professor, PhD, or something like that. Like very impressive people, but this is not their full-time job. So they have about half a day or four hours to make an investment decision. And so, of course, they're going to have a ton of questions. And it's not going to be enough information because this is not their full-time job all day, every day. So they tell the fund manager, this is a great deal, but could you please ask the founder to have a legal opinion on regulation and do a five-year projection of their finances and also to have one of our experts look into their code. And so the fund manager, after six weeks of talking to the founder or seeing the deal, bring the deal to the committee, goes back to the founder and says, hey, my committee loved it. I'd be super interested in investing, but you need to do all of this work first. And now if you're a founder that is only targeting Latin American market and you haven't been able to be well connected in the US, you have no other option. You have to wait the full nine months between first meeting and money in the bank. But if you're a founder that is US market, then you have access to US funds. Most of the time the founder tells them that Latin American fund manager, oh, that's right, you guys, we closed around three weeks ago. So thanks, but no thanks. And so that's the problem with having the investment committee be an external one. Then the second rule that hurts, I feel, VCs in Latin America that's brought from private equity is having a hurdle rate. So a hurdle rate is kind of like a liquidation preference for VCs. Normally it's 8%. And what that means is that you have to have an internal rate of return of 8% or higher before that fund manager starts seeing money from the profits of the investments. And what that does is that punishes risk. So let's say that you calculate your IRR today, your internal rate of return today, and you have a 10% or a 9% IRR. That means that you're past the threshold, you're going to be making money. But there's a company that shows up that allows anybody to have a private driver. And so on the regulation side, it's kind of gray area. We don't really know if this is going to be a problem in the courts. And so, you know what? I'm not going to risk it. I'd rather not risk my 9% internal rate of return. I'm not going to invest in Uber. And so you don't invest in Uber and now you don't return your funds necessarily. So it's punishing risk, where the whole point of venture capital is that you're taking the riskier bets for better rewards or better returns. And it's supposed to play a small part in an entire investment portfolio, 10% or less of an investment portfolio, because its whole purpose is to be like a vaccine in case there's a market downturn. Your little fund, your little allotment will stabilize your entire portfolio. And then the third and most painful restriction. And I think this is the one that the killer and the, the, the one that's killing most VC funds in Latin America is that because they receive money from development banks um, and multilateral funds that they're trying to push economic development and the people making those decisions are employees that won't be there in 10 years. Those banks ask for the investment, the transaction to occur in their home country. So you have to invest in a Chilean company you cannot invest in the Delaware C-Corp. You have to invest in the Colombian company, in the Colombian SaaS, not in the Delaware C-Corp, in the Argentinian company, not in the Delaware C-Corp, in the Mexican company, not in the Delaware C-Corp. Although Mexico actually, their second generation of funds, they changed that rule. So that's more progressive. The problem with that is that the entrepreneur that you know goes to YC in two days, raises $3 million at a $50 million cap, that is from Latin America, whether the product is US or Latin America. Normally they're oversubscribed, And here comes a VC fund says, hey, could you please create a local subsidiary? I'll invest in that subsidiary and then we'll do an equity swap with the Delaware C Corp and we'll do all this paperwork and all this legal stuff so that you can let me in. Of course, the entrepreneur is going to be like, we don't have time for that. We're oversubscribed. No, thanks, but no thanks. And so I feel like those three technicalities that are imposed by the LPs, rules set by the development banks are making it so that great fund managers are not able to be competitive with US VCs. When they could be, it's just that the rules that they align to or they subscribe to don't allow them to. Yeah, I think those structural issues really are uh, hit the nail on the head there because you said nine months to get a deal done. That's not an exaggeration. We literally had a deal that closed just now that was nine and a half, ten months 
from saying, yes, we're pretty interested to actual money in the bank. <laughs> and they had to go through the same, I mean, the term sheet says, yes, we want to do it, but it still needs to be approved by Corfo, which is the Chilean right. sort of development entity. And the other piece that I think is really important is that they're not able to invest in that Delaware C. I mean, if you look at our best companies in our portfolio, they almost all of them, except maybe one or two, have Delaware C. And mm -hmm. they're just not going to do it where you invest in the lower, the Chilean subsidiary or the Argentine or Colombian subsidiary and go to the US. It's just not going to happen. And the piece that I think maybe is underappreciated is that you'll have managers that maybe like in Chile, they'll have $4 million of LP money and then they might get another, call it eight or 12 on top of it from the development bank. Mm -hmm. When it's a small chunk of your total fund, you really have to worry about what Corfo thinks of each one of your deals because you're so reliant on them and it makes it really difficult to make decisions. What the result of that is that you'll have entrepreneurs that couldn't get funding in the U.S. Maybe their market is local. And so they have no other options. And those are the ones that are going to the local VCs. And so now you have both parties complaining. You have the entrepreneurs saying, oh, there's not enough VCs in my country. And then you have the fund managers complaining, there's not enough good deals in the country. Yeah, and at least you have in Chile, I'm not sure if it's true other places, but you also have rules on some of the lower capital VCs. Like in Chile, many of the Corfo-backed VCs can't invest in a company that has already gotten around $150,000 in revenue, not in profit, but in revenue. And it's a well-meaning rule because they don't want, you know, late stage companies to get this early stage seed money that's backed by the government. But again, we couldn't have invested in any of our top companies if we had had Corfo money because they all had more than 150000 in sales when we invested. And so it just blocked off the best companies in a country from the funds. And then they wonder why, you know, some of the funds aren't doing so well. I mean, that's the frustrating part because they were well-intentioned. But the solution was pretty simple in order to do that, just have valuation caps. The problem is that in almost all development banks that I've spoken to, you know, very sophisticated business people, everywhere from down to the entrepreneur, to the journalist, to the development banks and the heads of development banks, it's that they don't understand the difference between revenue and valuation. They focus so much on the revenue because our history has been on commodities. Your company is only worth maybe three times what you sell because you're selling coffee or copper or oil or whatever. But in, in technology, the valuation revenue is not the only correlation into valuation. So they could have easily created a rule where it says valuations under 10 million or valuations under 5 million. But because their background is not from that world, they are still focusing too much on revenue. I've actually seen how because the funds are not necessarily returning, there's usually fund managers that their first fund was backed by multilateral doesn't necessarily do fantastically well or doesn't return any capital. But because they're already a seasoned fund manager, multilateral funds give them their second fund and their third fund. And so at the end, the fund manager does make money just off of the management fees. But if it was a requirement that the fund manager only made money when the entrepreneur made money, they probably wouldn't have agreed to those rules because there's no way they were going to make money just on the carry, which is that profit from what you invest. And I don't think it's going to change. I think it's going to be there for a while that you can be a successful fund manager living very well off of the management fees without seeing returns by aligning to the private equity rules that shouldn't be there for venture capital just because the multilateral funds keep enforcing this. Yep. And I think that's right. And that's one of those things that we're sort of banking on at Magma that we're going to have a long horizon here, maybe two, three, five years of being able to operate as one of the only privates in Chile and even in, in Latin America that we can do deals that others can't just because they have this public money. Mm -hmm. And so changing the subject just a little bit to focus back on the entrepreneurs, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs that are just getting started? Maybe they're just building a product and they're not sure if they want to go to the US or if they're in Latin America. What would be kind of your first couple steps to get them thinking about, well, maybe can I go to the US? Yes. Yeah, so I think anybody can go to the US or can compete in the US without even going. We actually have a portfolio company that they're a project management system on top of Google Apps. It's called WorkUp.com. And I like to use that example because when I tell entrepreneurs, oh, yeah, you can launch in the U.S. It's super easy. It's better than Latin America. 
I know what they're thinking. They roll their eyes, at least in their mind, <laughs> and say, of course, Andres is going to say that. He lived most of his life in the U.S. You know, I don't live in the U.S. I don't know the U.S. But that's why I like using this story. The entrepreneur, when the founder of WorkUp, he created the company, I think when he was still 20 years old or so. He had never been to the U.S. And when he started building the company, he didn't speak English. And I think to this day, he's been to the U.S. maybe four days his entire life. One for an event in Miami and then another for an event in San Francisco. Maybe a week tops he's been in the U.S. And he built this tool because he was solving a problem for himself. Because for all the projects that he used to do as a consultant or in school or whatever, it was always very difficult to use the sun or use Basecamp because everything was in Google Drive and it wasn't connected. It was just a mess. So he just built it for himself. And so instead of thinking, hey, how come, why create a project management system for Colombia? Why not just create it for the world? He put it in English and he learned English by actually using one of our other portfolio companies, Cambly, and by having interns from the intern group, which was also a startup Chile company and they're in Chile as well. By having conversations with the interns in English and by practicing English. And he did this because we told him, hey, we're going to have some investors visit the city and we're going to give you the chance to pitch. But it needs to be in English because they don't speak Spanish. You have to learn English from here until then to, so you can pitch well and defend any questions and any positions that they might ask. You have all of three months to do it. And he figured it out. <laughs> I mean, maybe one out of 10 words didn't make any sense, but he was so confident about himself that it took off. And he's been able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars doing it. And my learning from that is that if the fear is language, it's still easier to learn English than to make it so that people have credit cards in Latin America. <laughs> and if the fear is, oh, what about competition? The founder in New York also has to compete against Amazon and compete against Uber and compete against Google. The competition will still be there. If the Silicon Valley company is not in Latin America yet, it's just because it's not profitable. Just like if you didn't want to have competition, why not open up a restaurant in the South Pole? There's no competition there. It's just not profitable. So the best way to beat a competitor, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, is by doing less, much better. And that's where the Latin American founders have an advantage over the founders in the U.S. The advantage a U.S. founder has or a founder, an entrepreneur in New York has over the, the entrepreneur in Santiago is that when the entrepreneur in New York launches a product for their friends in New York, it's already global. But that advantage is short lived. Because the problem becomes making sure that they can build a better product faster than their competitors. And then being in New York or being in San Francisco placed against them because they cannot afford the really good engineers. They have to grab junior engineers that might be brilliant, but don't know how to score code at scale and with other people. And it's going to take a long time to hire them and they're going to leave very quickly. So it's like you're treading on water of recruiting, training and losing people constantly. And this is where the long-term advantage of the entrepreneur in Santiago or the entrepreneur in Buenos Aires or in Mexico City is where they can get more senior software engineers faster that will stay in the company longer than their competitor in New York. And that competitive advantage is worth a lot more than launching a product for your friends and being global for the short term, which is what the New York founder has. And so the way to figure out how to compete in the U.S. is... First, start by solving a problem that you've yourself lived. And most of the problems that you can launch in the U.S. from Latin America are problems that are work-related, not food delivery, not how do I book an appointment with a doctor. They're work-related. So project management system, analytics suite, like whatever it is. So you don't have to travel to the U.S. And two, if you have a competitor already, just build less and do it better. I would much rather compete against Amazon in the U.S. It's easier than create the Amazon of Latin America. And there's companies doing it. And when those companies start growing with a high rate of growth, Amazon acquires them for billions of dollars. And so in any case, it's way better to launch in the US. And it doesn't mean that you're going to not be successful in Latin America. You're going to be successful. And if you're a good entrepreneur, you're going to be successful whether in the US or in Latin America. It's just how successful do you want to be? Do you want to have a hundred million dollar company or do you want to have a billion dollar company for the same effort and for the same time? So let's talk about entrepreneurs that come to pitch you and team. What are some of the top mistakes that you see them doing when they get their first meeting with you? Well, I usually try to break the traditional pitch meeting and I want to have a conversation. So I tell them, assume that I'm convinced that your market is the best market and your product is the best product. Otherwise, I wouldn't be meeting with you. So I've already vetted that before I'm taking the meeting. And so the conversation that I want to have is... I want the entrepreneur to tell me what their main KPI is. And ideally, they would tell me, yes, my main KPI is bookings, my main KPI is weekly active users, or money lent, or whatever KPI is. 
And then we talk about what the rate of growth has been for that KPI and whether or not they know how to code with whether they live the problem and how they met their team. Usually that can be a, a 30 minute conversation and I'll tell them whether I invest or not that same day um, or in the call. But that's the ideal situation. But more often than not, we can't get past the first point of figuring out what that KPI is. And so a lot of entrepreneurs say, oh, yes, we've made a million dollars in revenue. And so I have to explain to them and convince them that unless you're selling a device, there's probably a better KPI than revenue. It could be page views, it could be bookings, it could be rides, it could be nights, it could be something that shows the value that you're creating. And that's correlational to the valuation of your company, which is not revenue. And so once we land at that KPI, then it's another 20 minute conversation for me to get them to tell me what the rate of growth is. And I have to explain this is change over time. And they've usually never calculated it. They've never measured the KPI in a week to week basis or in a month to month basis. They've only been looking at absolute numbers like, oh, we have a thousand downloads or we made a hundred thousand dollars in monthly run rate. But what I want to see is the rate of growth change over time. So then I have to help them. And this becomes a 40 minute call, figure out how many bookings they had the first week that they launched, then the second week, then the third week, then the fourth week. More often than not, I tell them just do the homework and then we'll do another call. So I think the biggest problem that I have when I have conversation with entrepreneurs is that they don't know what their KPI is, their key performance indicator, and they haven't measured what change over time has been. So they can tell me, yes, we're going 30% month over month in bookings. They just don't know those numbers because they've never been asked those numbers, apparently. <laughs> they only know that they have 10,000 downloads or they've made $500,000 in revenue. So figuring out that number one KPI and then the rate of change should be something that all the entrepreneurs that are going to meet you should know before they get there. For sure. I don't even look at the pitch deck. I don't look at the PowerPoint. I just want to talk about that and then learn more about the team. And that's it. And I'll make an investment decision within 30 minutes. And what kind of stage do you guys invest in these days? We invest in companies that have a valuation under $30 million. And we like to invest when they're first getting started. So when your valuation usually starts at two, two point five million, most of our deals are are happening at at caps, not valuations, because we're, we're doing mostly saves right now. Most of our deals happen at caps of eight million. So our sweet spot is between four and eight million. We've done deals at fifteen million caps as well. But in the beginning, we like to write checks of between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars, with the ability to follow on in any given company, no more than $5 million throughout the life of the company. So that means that we don't lead rounds, we don't set terms, we don't sit on board seats, but that allows us to actually be there to help more than just demand why you're not selling more, but rather you give us what problem you're having and it is our job to fix it. And how many companies per year are you hoping to be able to invest in? We thought we were going to do about 15 companies per year or 20 companies per year, but in Q1 and Q2, we did 18. So we're reevaluating the number of companies. So more likely than not, we're going to be writing just bigger checks. And for the next year and a half, do another 15, another 20 from this particular fund. And then fund two will probably start late 2018, 2019. But the idea is to do between 15 and 24 companies a year. Uh, it's interesting. That's a good number of companies. And so what's next for you and for First Rock? So next we are starting to do... Well, the, the larger checks and building out a larger engineering pipeline and process to have our companies hit the ground running faster with the best engineers in Latin America and then helping the companies and those engineers that they hire because they usually hire the, the first hire that they do is a VP of engineering. So it's helping that VP of engineering scale out their team, go from one engineer in Latin America to 10 engineers in Latin America with as little pain as possible in terms of bureaucracy and banks and things like that. We handle all of that. And then something else that we're working on is because we have a lot of companies and they're in different stages, when our company needs need to raise the next round of funding, in addition to doing VC intros, which are fine, what we found that works a lot better is when we have the founder that's raising a new round, talk to a founder that already raised around that size within the last six months. And then that founder that has already raised the money will introduce them to their VCs. And so this is a very scalable and very quick way to help our founders close the rounds faster. And for our portfolio entrepreneurs, it comes like an easy way to pay it forward. Of like, I just raised my A round six months ago. Let me help another entrepreneur raise their A round. And so we've been doing that manually. We're working on building a platform to make that a little bit more automated. 
as we're scaling up the number of companies that we have and also how much money they're raising. That's pretty cool. That's a good strategy. I like it. So you've been at this for, you've been doing startups now since you were in college and then investing and building companies for, when did you guys start with investing? 2013. What is that? Four years ago? Yeah, four or five years ago now. And, and then I started being an entrepreneur in 2005. So that is 12 years ago. And so what advice would you give to yourself at your start of your entrepreneurial career 12 years ago, knowing what you know now? And then what would you give yourself as an investor going four years back, knowing what you know now? Yeah. So as an entrepreneur, that advice is kind of what drives our investment DT. So the first one is your co-founder should be somebody that will be good at whatever company you decide to build. So pick the co-founder before you pick the company. And that's just because I've lived through having a company that was an app store for software as a service business apps to doing an ad network with the same founder. Had I picked somebody because they're really good at software as a service, they would have made them useless in my ad network. So they have to be people that are at your level, that you admire, that you respect, that you trust, and that are charismatic. That's above or has more priority than being a great salesperson or a great engineer. And I expect that I can do the work they do and vice versa. Like I'm not 100% sold on the idea that I have a technical founder. All they do is just code all day and they don't like talking to customers or they're bad at talking to customers or the business co-founder that can't put together a prototype together. I don't like so much the whole idea of complementary. Like you, sure, you can be complementary, but building a company for 10 years requires more than just the selling or more than just the coding. So they should be pretty good at both. And that worked for me with my co-founders that were able to do both things, both the technical and the business side. Then second, and that's also because I did it the wrong way as well, solve problems like the business opportunities are easier when it's a problem that you've lived yourself and you're the first customer rather than seeing that there's a trend in Bitcoin and or cryptocurrency and, I don't know, on-demand drone deliveries and then trying to build a company around that. It's way better to solve a problem that you've lived or that you're currently living because that's what's going to make you the trendsetter and you will be creating the new hot thing. And so that's my second advice. And then my third advice is to launch, and we talked about this, to launch your product where there's the largest number of customers that have the most money that will give it to you the fastest. And I also learned this from doing the TechCrunch of Latin America. I also tried at some point to do the user voice of Latin America. I'm sure I tried something else for Latin America. I forget. But, you know, all of those just proved that it was just way harder to launch where there's less customers that have less money that will take longer to give it to you. So that's the advice I'd give to entrepreneurs. And that's why they are reflected in our investment thesis. As an investor, I got advice myself from a few investor friends that helped a lot. The first advice, which is the hardest for entrepreneurs that are turning into investors, it's way easier if you come from the world of finance and you become a VC. But if you're an entrepreneur, there's this terrible bad habit that I fight with every day I meet an entrepreneur where you love the idea, you love the market, and it's so obvious to you that you start envisioning what the future of the product and the business should be. And you get excited because you imagine what the company could be with you running it. But the reality is you're not going to run it. So... The advice there would be only invest in entrepreneurs that you think can do a better job than you can. If you think you know better and you're going to be helping them because you know better about their market or you know better about their industry, I would just advise against investing in them because you have to see it as an opportunity. Like the entrepreneur is going to do you a favor of multiplying your money. If you think you're doing the entrepreneur a favor by helping them with their business, you're probably going to lose your money. And so that's inertia that we have as entrepreneurs turning investors. And then the other advice that I Thank God I got early on and I didn't make this mistake, but I got early on is in the beginning, invest very small checks. So instead of investing $500,000 in one company, try to invest, you know, maybe $25,000 per company. And that way you can have 20 companies or invest less if you can get away with it. If you can invest $10,000 per company, just invest less. And that will allow you to learn in the first couple of years, because it's very likely that you're going to make a ton of mistakes investing in the first couple of years. And so that's what I did in the beginning. And part of what I learned by investing small checks in a lot of companies is Latin American market can be a great business as an entrepreneur, as a single entrepreneur, maybe debatable, but you can be very successful regardless. But as a fund, as a portfolio, it sucks because my best performing Latin American companies usually have the same or lower valuation than the companies that I invested in that didn't exist three months ago or six months ago. And those I'm making companies are profitable. They're making millions of dollars. Their valuation is the same or lower than those companies that didn't exist six months ago that their market's the US. So that's 
a result of investing small checks. And I think that's kind of the things that have helped me not lose a lot of money and hopefully be making money and returns as a fund manager, especially now that I'm transitioning from investing my own money to investing my own plus other people's money. That initial kind of MBA that I did as an investor was super useful to have a very solid investment thesis today that I can defend. Yeah, I think that makes sense, especially the part about getting started in VC by investing your own money to get going. I think that that's, you know, showing the most amount of skin in the game possible. If you're doing it yourself and then going and asking for other people's money, I think that's a really good way of doing it. It's the same thing we right. want as well. Yeah, that's why actually Magma is one of the very few funds that I recommend entrepreneurs talk to in Latin America when they say, hey, who do, what Latin American investors do you recommend? It's Magma and two other funds that I'll leave without naming so that other people can think of them. Um, <laughs> but it's very few. Yeah, I agree. There's not that many that we send entrepreneurs to and you guys are on the list. So it's been good. We've done a couple of deals together and I hope we can do more in the future. And thanks again for taking the time to do this conversation with me. I think we talked about a lot of issues that maybe don't get much play even in Latin America about the structural issues, why going to the US makes sense. I think that we've been able to cover a lot of good ground. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for doing all of this work. I think it's fantastic for the ecosystem. No, you guys too. I mean, you're leading the way with you guys got to start first and started paving the way with companies like Authy and Blue Smart. So it's great to see you guys having success and raising the new fund and starting to invest even more. Thank you. Well, have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Crossing Borders with Andres Barreto. If you did, please check us out on iTunes or Stitcher by searching Crossing Borders or going to NathanLustig.com where you can find all of the episodes. It would really be helpful if you gave me a rating on iTunes especially because that helps other people find the podcast. So if you've enjoyed yourself, please check it out. Thanks. Thanks.